Now, uh, now we're going, I think. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. So when I was planning this, I wasn't quite sure who the audience would be. And I was kind of in my mind hoping that it would be some families that we could give some real practical tips on how to grow in holiness as a family and how parents could help their kids to understand their giftedness and what their vocation might be. But as I was listening to the bishop last night, um, he brought out a really good point. As disciples, we're meant to help sharpen each other's iron. And we may not have families right here with us today who need all these things, but I'm sure that you can touch other families' lives and share what some of these tips might be. Plus, they'll be posted, so hopefully some other people will um, tune in. So anyway, let's start with a prayer. How's that sound? <clears throat> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Gracious and loving God, you have blessed families with the grace and privilege of becoming parents. Provide them with all they need in accepting this awesome responsibility. Bless all families with what they need to be faithful servants. As we gather today, we pray to be open to your spirit, who is the source of strength. As families witness, and especially their children, the love you have for them and the desire for them to be happy and to live a full life. We ask your help today to guide our conversations. Help us guide all children to believe that they each have a special calling to use their gifts and talents for others. Help all families to recognize the giftedness in their children and to nurture their calling from you. We ask this as all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so for this workshop, we're going to need a couple of things that have been sent to you. you. Guys got a flower pot? Yes. Okay. There goes Lil. She's going to get her flower pot, probably. And how about the dirt? And you need the seeds. Flower pot. Yeah. What's next? You should have some uh, magic markers for a little bit later. Okay. And there should be um, a shield. Okay. Hopefully enough shields for each kid. Yeah. And then one sheet that's got the quotes from Pope Francis when we start to talk about holiness. Okay, you're all set. Perfect. I don't have the shields. Oh. You don't have a shield? Nope. Have it. I got the dirt. That's all right, nope. Lily. When we get to that, you can uh, just use a piece of paper. Okay. Okay, let's talk, let's talk first about baptism. How many of you know the date of your baptism? What? How many of you know the date of your baptism? How about the, how about the Tartaglia kids? Do you guys know the date of your baptism? Not the exact date. They don't. <laughs> I bet you know your birth date. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, here's what Pope Francis has said about baptism. As the first of seven sacraments, baptism is the door that permits Christ to make his dwelling in us and allows us to immerse ourselves in his mystery. Pope Francis says we should know the date of our baptism because it's another birthday. It's the day of our rebirth. He goes on and says, no one deserves baptism 
which is always a gift for everyone, adults and newborns. But like what happens to a seed full of life, this gift takes root and brings forth fruit in a land that's nourished by faith. Okay, I don't think we really take the time to really appreciate and understand the power of baptism. I know it's, it took me a long, long time into my adult life before I could really appreciate that. Yet, it's the most important day of our lives because we were born and reborn into the life of Christ. So let's talk a little bit about seeds and plants. How about you Tartaglia kids? What does a plant or what does a seed need in order to grow? Water, sun. Water? Soil. Water, sun, soil. Sun, soil. Uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, heat. Okay, maybe some heat. Yeah. Anything else? Protected. Okay. It it needs some doesn't it also need someone to take care of it? Yes. Yes. It does need someone to nourish it. Or to nurture it, I'm sorry. So why don't you take those pots and why don't you plant some of those seeds? Okay. No fighting over that pot now, Tartaglia kids. <laughs> You got to them very well. <laughs> Do we use the whole bag? It's up to you. You might not need to. Okay. While you're doing that, I've got to go let my dog in. All the seeds? Yeah. All the seeds. Good coffee break. All of the seeds? I saw a necklace. Where is he now? Um, Nick. Let's see. I would. I would. It was a good question. They're so small. This doesn't sit. Here, put them for you. you They're mustard seeds. Okay. Maria, do you have any extra mustard seeds? The the you got one of those? Let me see how big it is. Oh, it's that's like a tiny, tiny. Like Can I see that? Do you have one for me? It's, it's hard to... Okay. Hard to Got see. it planted? Yeah. Almost. You can, see you can put more than one in. That, can you see it? Yeah. That's how tiny it is. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna get to all set. More. They're taught they're very tiny, aren't they? They're really, very tiny. Uh -huh. Here we go. You, know, you probably, you probably remember in the scriptures that uh, Jesus talks about mustard seeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About how small they are. Mm -hmm. You want to sit down? Do you remember that, Maria, Sophia? Yep. All right, you guys all set? You got them all planted? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And by the way, you can also decorate that pot. Not, not today. Um, sometime you can uh, take that paper that's around it and color it and do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Okay. So. What, what's going to happen with that seed that you just planted if nobody takes care of it? It won't survive. It's just going to shrivel up. It's just going to sit there, isn't it? Yeah. If you don't water it and take care of it, it's just going to sit there. Yeah. Maybe it'll sprout, but more than likely it's not going to. Let's think about baptism that way. At your baptism... God planted a seed. He planted a seed just like you just did. And it's going to sit there unless you nurture that seed and make it grow. Kind of like grace. Grace is a gift that's given to you, but if you don't want it. And if you don't take care of it, it's not going to be able to help you. 
So I, I call that my spirit seed. You can call it whatever you want, but that's my spirit seed. And just like you have to plant that seed and take care of what you just did, you have to do the same thing with the seed inside you. Okay? What are some ways that you can nourish the spirit seed inside you? Okay. By going to Mass, the sacrament. Excellent. Mass and the sacraments, for sure. What else? Studying, studying the faith. Okay, studying the faith. Beatitudes. Okay. Mercy. Living the Beatitudes. That's really, really good. Because the more we do good in our lives, the more that seed is going to sprout and bear fruit eventually. Okay, so do you see the connection then between baptism? It all starts with baptism and that seed. Mm -hmm. uh, prayer, another thing, we've got to pray. But where does the family fit into this? They help you along. Exactly. Because that kids, young children in a family, a lot of times they can't take themselves to mass. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to study the faith. They rely on parents and maybe big brothers and sisters. So that's why it's so important for us to help families to understand their role in nurturing that seed. And nurturing that seed. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with the time. <laughs> <laughs> and Lil too, for that matter. But don't forget, what you might learn today, you can share with others other families, and other kids. So, Kathy, if I can I jump in. So, sure can. Can, they, can they also do that with their friends? Absolutely. How, yeah. how would they go about sharing with their friends if they're, like, in a public school? Is this okay to ask? Sure. How about it, guys? Can you think of a way that you can help other people see to grow even in school? By sending an example. Oh, I love that. I love that. Wasn't it St. Francis that said something about preaching the gospel and use words only if you need to? And his point was, by example, that's the best way to do it. Anything else you can think? What if you... <clears throat> What if you go to the cafeteria and you see a kid sitting all by himself? Just by being, uh, being a good person and just, just helping people out. Yeah. Yeah, going and maybe sitting with that person or asking that person to sit with you. What yeah. if you see somebody being mean to another kid? Well, then you, you stand up for them. You should stop. Yeah. Is it easy? No. No, it's not easy. It's not meant to be easy. No. That's part of carrying our cross, isn't it? Okay. But it, after you do that, you get a nice feeling inside that you've done something really good. One place where the kids have struggled is riding the bus to and oh. from school. There's a lot of conversations on there that aren't quite what we would like them to be. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It, there's a lot of people in the world who need the gospel preached to them, isn't there? A lot of people. Let's talk about the mustard seed for just a little teeny bit here. That mustard seed that you just planted, if you take care of it, should sprout in five to ten days. It's going to grow really fast. Because it's a mustard seed, it's going to spread really fast. <clears throat> and you should see flowers within six weeks. And there's a little picture, looks like this, of what the variety of mustard seed in the Holy Land looks like. The kind of mustard seed Jesus was talking about. So if you put that in relationship to that spirit seed that we each have in ourselves, Wow. 
if that is nurtured in ourselves by our families and by our good deeds, it's going to germinate just like that mustard seed. It's going to grow very fast. And likewise, the opposite's true as well. So maybe as a little project, your family can watch that pot over the next few days and weeks. Take care of it. Check it. See if it's sprouting. And maybe have a conversation about how your own spirit seed is being nurtured. How you're feeling about that. And maybe how people in your family can help you with that a little bit over the next few weeks. Okay, so that's baptism. Any questions about that? Don't forget about that spirit seed. Really, really important. Really important. Okay, let's talk about holiness. Might need that sheet. Okay. Yeah, there we go. You got it. That little seed from baptism is where holiness starts. And it grows as that little seed is nurtured by good deeds and by what we do in the family. So let's, I want to talk about this after I read this to you. So let's look at the questions just to have an idea in your head, especially Maria, you're older and your sister, what's your name again in the, in the yellow? Oh, I'm Sophia. Sophia, okay. So you two girls are older, so you guys can help us with the discussion, I'm sure. So as you listen, what strikes you about Pope Francis's words here as he talks about holiness? And according to Pope Francis, how can an ordinary person like you and me become holy? And what might a good definition of holiness be? What are some of the things that you can do right now as a family to increase holiness? And what would you like to share with the group? Okay? So have those questions in mind as we go through here. <clears throat> okay, so this is what Pope Francis says. All this makes us understand that in order to be saved, there's no need to be bishop, priest, or religious. No, we are all called to be saints. So many times we are tempted to think that sainthood is reserved only to those who have the opportunity to break away from daily affairs in order to dedicate themselves exclusively to prayer. But it is not so. Some think that sanctity is to close your eyes and look at a holy icon. No, this is not sanctity. Sanctity is something deeper, greater, which God gives us. Indeed, it is precisely in living with love and offering one's own personal witness in everyday affairs that we are called to become saints. And each in the conditions and the state of life in which he or she finds him or herself. But you are consecrated. Are you consecrated? Be a saint by living out your donation and your ministry with joy. Are you married? Be a saint by loving and caring to your husband or your wife, as Christ did for the church. Are you an unmarried baptized person? Be a saint by carrying out your work with honesty and competence, and by offering time in the service of your brothers and sisters. But Father, I work in a factory. I work as an accountant, only with numbers. You can't be a saint there. Or I go to school. I can't be a saint there. Yes, you can. There, where you work, you can become a saint. God gives you the grace to become holy. God communicates himself to you. Always in every place, you become a saint. 
That is, one can open oneself up to this grace, which works inside us and leads us to holiness. Are you a parent or a grandparent? Be a saint by passionately teaching your children and grandchildren to know and follow Jesus. And it takes so much patience to do this, to be a good parent, a good grandfather, a good mother, a good grandmother. It takes so much patience. And with this patience comes holiness. By exercising patience. Are you a catechist? An educator or a volunteer? Be a saint by becoming a visible sign of God's love and of his presence alongside us. This is it. Every state of life leads to holiness, always. In your home, on the street, at work, at church, in the moment, and in your state of life, the path to sainthood has been opened. Don't be discouraged to pursue this path. It is God alone who gives us the grace. The Lord asks only this, that we be in communion with him and at the service of our brothers and sisters. I love that. Yeah. Anybody want to tell us what struck you about that? Um, um, something that struck me about that was um, that a lot of times people are tempted to think that the sainthood is only reserved for people who um, can dedicate themselves to prayer and everything, when it's not. Yeah, like like priests, you mean, and nuns? Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Anybody else? What struck me was that, like, you don't need to... You know, we're just wherever you are, there's always something good you can do. You don't have to, well, it's kind of goes with what she was saying, but like, like just in every state, or um, it said, in every state of life leads to holiness always. You just, there's no excuse. Yeah. Wow. Stuff. So. Maybe you can take over this workshop and read it. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent insight. Really good. You know that I was probably, 25 or 30 years old before I realized that I didn't have to be a priest or a nun or a bishop in order to be a saint. It took me that long. I don't know why. So it's pretty common for people to think, oh no, not me. I can't do it. Anybody else? Lil, how about you? Did anything like you? Um, I got that a bit that it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing. You're a saint. You could be. I sometimes uh, used to go down to New York City and I rode a bus and I did the rosary on it one day. And this African American lady had asked me what I was doing and why. So I explained it to her that that's my faith, that's part of what I do. So I believe I was a saint at that time because I was explaining to her what was going on. And it, like I said, or the article says, it doesn't matter where you are, it's what you do that, be, that makes you a saint. Right. Mm -hmm. Your, uh, one thing that struck me is uh, Pope Francis talks about making work. He doesn't use these words, but he talks about making work a ministry. Mm -hmm. Making work a ministry. Now, for Steve and myself, it's not hard. We work for the church. But how about you guys who are in school? That's your work right now to be in school, right? Yeah. How can you make that a ministry? Try to do your best in school, I guess. Mm -hmm. Or with other people. Mm -hmm. Just lead by example with other people. As we said earlier. Yeah, some of the things that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And, you know, it, it can be anywhere. It can be on the bus, it can be in the cafeteria, it can be in a classroom. It can really be anywhere. To turn whatever it is you're doing into a real ministry, which means you're doing it for God. 
And I love the fact that he emphasizes so much example. Pope Francis doesn't talk about long sermons and, and lots of talk. He talks about example. Really important for him that, you know, we can't beat people over the head with a lot of stuff. We have to learn by seeing it lived in our own lives. That's the best way to convert people, by example. So how can an ordinary person like you and me be a saint? Well, um, the, uh, carrying out your work, um, as it says in the paper, with honesty and competence and just offering time to help others. Yeah. Exactly. I read recently that Mother Teresa was talking about it like you've been we've been talking about action where there is a need. And it, I've been thinking about a, a neighbor of ours who had a birthday that doesn't get to see hardly anybody because they can't get out of their house due to a health condition. But we were um, planning to make a cake. So I think that would be a good way to share God's love with somebody who may be very lonely. Yeah, excellent. Especially in the pandemic that we're in. Yeah, making a phone call, asking how somebody is, you know, just little tiny simple things. How about a definition of holiness? Anybody want to give a shot? What's a good definition of holiness? Um, yeah, you outlined it. So. Oh, I highlighted something that I thought might be a good definition. But um, living with love and offering one's um, Christian witness in everyday affairs, um, that we are called to become saints. Maybe. Well, yeah, I like Matthew Kelly's definition too. He talks about um, becoming your best self. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that, if we grow that that uh, spirit seed that we got in baptism, we will become our best self by do, by nurturing that along the way. So, how about as a family? How do you feel you you grow each other as a family? If you're willing to share that, helping each other out, we show each other that we actually love each other instead of just fighting and stuff. No, you don't fight, do you? No. no. There are moments, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Showing each other uh, that we that um. Showing each other that we can uh, just help each other out and learn and help each other to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And saying I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Saying you're sorry. Yeah. You no. Know? I think specific, you know, some specific things like instead of punching or hitting your <laughs> brother or sister who annoys you, using words instead of hitting, you know, something like that. Or if you see mom or dad bringing in a lot of groceries, run out and help. Yeah. Yeah. Offer to, the table, <laughs> offer to do the dishes, you know, think little things like that. Uh, and and the whole while you're nurturing that spirit seed. You're helping it to grow and become stronger. We're gonna put you on speed dial, Mr. Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Time they have a fight, you're gonna call me. You got <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, that's that's holiness, and hopefully, you can see the relationship between baptism and, and holiness. Is there anything else on living a holy life that we maybe talk about? Um, oh, nothing comes. Letting God work in your life, but I liked how you guys talked about concrete things in the everyday life. Because when when we're living our lives, sometimes the it's easy to get annoyed 
and forget forget ways to be loving towards the people that we love that we sh that we're in a family with and mm -hmm. and then our greater family the world very true isn't it very true lil any last words of wisdom on holiness from you um like the family knows i was like the school grandmother and a lot of times there was a problem child if I was in that room with them, I would take them out, take them for a walk, and talk to them, try to smooth them down. But at the same time, in my own mind, I was praying for that child, okay? And I think just showing the school, the kids, that I loved each and every one of them, that was my family. And I always looked forward to going in, into the school, knowing that I'm going to get the love from them, but at the same time, I was returning the love by being there. So I think sometimes your presence is a big thing too. They see it. Yeah, goes back to that example thing. Yep. Are you gonna try to find another school, Will? Um, no, because it's too far for me to travel to Governor or to uh, Messina. I thought about going into a public school, but it would be so different. I don't know if I could adjust to it. So my goddaughter has two girls that would be going into the public school, um, actually Medill. And uh, she asked me if I would do the virtual training with the kids at home, and I said yes. So being that the girls know me, they would feel comfortable with me, and I would be able to take my time doing it with them. Yeah. Well, that's good. And you'll be able to show good example to them. Exactly. Yep. All righty. Uh, let's see. Check my notes here. In terms of um, in terms of helping other families, I know that the Tartaglia family doesn't have to ask this question, but you know, a family really needs to ask themselves, what kind of a life do you really want for your kids? What kind of a life do you really want for your kids? And then the second question is, how do you make it happen? Because it's not going to happen automatically. It takes work. It takes work and it takes prioritization and really a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've seen it with my own family, with my own brother and sister-in-law, the way they've raised their kids. None of them go to church anymore. So, and that's despite my trying <laughs> to be a good influence in their lives. So, I think the first thing to share with families is to slow down. Our lives are so, so fast these days. To slow down. And, and I know a lot of families, parents have kids involved in too many activities. They're running constantly from one thing to another. So how do you see your home? Do you see your home as a domestic church, as a little sanctuary, a place where the love of God is supposed to grow? And if if you do as a family, and if you can share that with another family, then how are you supposed to act inside that family, inside that home? It really has ramifications. So the, you know, and it also might mean that the TV's not on all the time, that the kids aren't playing video games or Minecraft all the time. <laughs> Although Minecraft's a good thing, I know that. So, <laughs> but you get it. I mean, so many kids can't get their faces out of their cell phones and off the internet. They have to be in constant touch. So it might mean limiting internet time. It might be making that suggestion to a family so that they can find time 
spend together. Don't be shaking your head. I see that. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing is for mom and dad to witness to a loving marriage. You know, in the way they treat each other and the way that spills over into the kid. And kids need to see that the parents believe prayer is important in their own lives. So kids should see mom and dad pray together. So that's another suggestion that could be made to a family, you know, that that is looking for some help. Being sure that they're they're starting to pray together, making an effort. Some practical suggestions, and I'm sure you guys can add to this. Um, there's, have you ever heard of the two tables? No. Two tables. The dining room table and the altar at church. The two tables. Those two. Yeah. And how similar those two tables are. And when you think about that, pretty powerful. That what goes on at the altar in church is similar to what we hope is going to go on at the dinner table. And think, so many families don't even eat together anymore. They, they don't have that experience of sitting down to the table together. And what do you do at that dinner table? Your stories. It's the same thing we do at the altar in church. We share the story of our faith. So at the dinner table, you know, how'd your day go? What are some of the miracles you saw happen today? How did God speak to you? Sometimes parents will say, well, how was your day? And the kids grunt, or they say, well, and you don't get any more out of them. Keep trying. Maybe change the question. What did God ask of you today and how did you respond? Okay, another, another thing, of course, is prayer. When do you pray together as a family? Obviously, for a family who's just getting started or wanting to get started, keeping it simple is probably the best advice. Bedtime is a great place to start. At the end of the day, encourage the family to kneel down maybe as a group. And then maybe the parent goes individually with the kid and prays individually. The other easy thing is the meal. Once you get in the habit of saying grace, it'll be second nature. It's just getting started. So those are two simple places to start with family prayer and then from there it can grow. Attending mass together, gotta be made a priority. Have you ever had your house? This one needs to be. What? Yeah. We're blessing, the, blessing the house. Oh yeah. When, whenever, um, whenever I move, they always ask the new pastor to come over and uh, bless the house, and then we have dinner together. So that you know that sends a message. So getting the house plus, and that can happen every year. It doesn't have to be once. It can happen every year. Um, how about sacred art? Do we have? Another thing a family can do that's crucifixes, pictures. And I'm, I'm not talking putting a whole bunch of gaudy pictures up all over the house. Not that at all. But just maybe one special place is designated where you could put up a crucifix. Um, I, in my house, when I was growing up, we had crucifixes in every bedroom. Um, I right now have a crucifix in my bedroom and I also have one by the door so that when I go out of the house, I see that crucifix. And if I'm able to remember, I might say a prayer as I go out of the house. 
So Sacred Heart, Sacred Art. Mm -hmm. Celebrating the seasons at home is another great way to do it. Okay. What can you do for Advent? What do you do for Advent? Well, I didn't hear that. Pray just a little bit more. Okay. What do we do for bedtime prayers? Um, oh, we, we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Do you have and an Advent? Yes. And what do you hang on the wall and you do every day? We have a little Advent calendar, and then it counts down um, the days. Is that what you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, do you, how could you easily celebrate Advent, for example, as a family? Uh, Jesse trees, mm -hmm. Advent wreaths, say a little prayer. I have to admit, we have an Advent wreath every Advent, but we rarely remember to light the candle and say the prayer. Yeah. Because it's not on the dinner table. So this year I'm going to try to put it on the dinner table in a place where we can remember to light the candle at least and say the prayer. How about Lent? How could a family celebrate Lent? Something. Have each one get something different. Yeah. Maybe do a little extra as a family to help those in need. Encourage each other, um, like, uh, just encourage each other, like, okay. yeah. What are some of the special Lenten devotions that we have? There's another class. Oh, you already said that. Yeah, station, that's what, I was, that's what I was looking for. A family could easily take a station of the cross and just talk about what that station means. Mm -hmm. Talk about what happened to Jesus and how that might apply to their own lives. That would be some simple thing that could be done during the season of Advent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our a lot of our time is ordinary time, but there are the special seasons. You know, the Christmas season. Um, do you bless your Christmas tree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And do I throw holy water at it? Yeah. Yep. We, we wait until Christmas Eve, the day of, and we make we make a special ceremony every year on Christmas Eve day, and we decorate the tree and we do the liturgy that the church provides to, to bless it and light it. So we do that every year. Beautiful. Yeah. And I'm kind of an environmentalist myself too. And when I used to have a real tree, I part of the prayer would be to thank the tree for its gift. You know, it's gift of giving itself up uh, to help us to celebrate the season. So I have an artificial tree now, but anyway, throw that out there. But, you know, how, how can we share these kinds of easy things with family? I mean, that's, that's always the challenge. Um, getting them to be interested and try to get them to do some of these things. It's interesting for me, the, um, the the practice of not putting up the tree, um, I, I learned that from neighbors when I was a kid because we always put ours up sort of toward the beginning of December, mm -hmm. but the neighbors down the street, they put theirs up on Christmas Eve, and I thought that was the weirdest thing ever. But now that I'm an adult and I have a family, to me that makes the most sense, and yeah. it's really made it meaningful for us, but it's something I learned from the neighbors. And their kids when I was a kid. Yeah, we used to put ours up growing up a, about a week before Christmas. But it, for me, I like the preparation leading up to Christmas more than I actually like Christmas itself. It's like boom and it's over. Mm -hmm. So I like to put the tree up early because it reminds me what's coming and it helps me to celebrate Advent. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's, you know, whatever works uh, for a family. Um, the important thing is, is adding that spiritual dimension. Um, another thing that would be really hard for a family to do is, you know, consecrate a place in the house, some small area, 
where everybody knows that's a quiet place where you can go and say a prayer or where the Bible might be where you could read a scripture passage, something like that. And it could just be a little table in the corner with a candle on it, some simple little thing like that. But it's a visual reminder of the importance of, of God. Um, using the Bible too is another thing. You know, reading a scripture passage maybe at, before you eat and just asking everyone what the passage means to them, that kind of thing. And I think somebody mentioned this before, but doing service as a family. You know, uh, Christine, I think you mentioned uh, the, the person next door who's going to get a birthday cake. That's a form of service. Um, helping a neighbor as a family rake the yard and the leaves start to fall. So it, it, as that's a message that gets sent to the kids about the importance of doing for others. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this or not, but during the pandemic, the formation office has been posting Facebook posts. And we've tried to make them practical little things that families could do to keep their sanity while trying to, to encourage the faith at home. Those are now available on the diocesan website. So you, could, you might be able to find some helpful hints there as well. Oh, beautiful. Um, for families, for yourselves maybe, and also to share with other families, given the opportunity. So those are there if you go to the Faith Formation Office and scroll. I guess you have to, right now you have to hit new because it's under construction. But if you hit new, they should be down toward the bottom. Okay. So that's kind of what I had gathered for holiness. Um, well, again, going back to that seed that's planted in baptism, it has to be nurtured. It has to be nurtured in the family. So that as we become older and more mature, we become older and mature in our faith. Mm -hmm. Let's talk next about vocation. And vocation springs from baptism. So how can parents how can parents help their children? to understand the notion of vocation, okay? First thing we need to do is start changing the language. We often hear, kids hear both in school and at home, what do you want to be when you grow up? You kids ever heard that? You heard it in school? Probably your parents have said it. <clears throat> Instead of seeing that, maybe what should say is what do you think God is calling you to be when you grow up? Kind of reinforces that idea that not just what you want to do. Really. The fact is you've been given a set of talents and abilities and gifts that are meant to be used for other people and we have to discover what those are. So there's the first thing instead of saying what do you want to be what do you think god's calling you to be and we've already talked about this as kids you guys you have a vocation right now what is it a student and friends in school being a good friend being a good student and in the family what's your vocation a good a good child. sibling yeah good brother good sister good son or good daughter. So again, talking more concretely, you know, we've talked about some of the things helpful. instead of hitting the words, you know, those kinds of things. Everything that we do is really a vocation because it's being open to the love of God. So parents, how can you help your children to figure out what God's calling them to be? 
How can you help children to understand the idea of you? Maria, do you know what the word unique means? The word what? The word unique. You know what that means? It means um, different. They're just not um, always the same. There's something special different. about the individual. As a person that How special? Um, very special, just not as if something is unique, it means there's not another thing exactly like it, okay? Unique is, is that special. And we're taught in our faith that God has made each person unique. And to think about that is something pretty awesome. That there's nobody, nobody else in the world exactly like that. In looks or in gifts and talents, nobody. That's an awesome thing. So, parents, how do you help your kids to understand and appreciate that whole idea of uniqueness and the difference that you see among your kids? <clears throat> Pretty hard with younger kids, but as kids get older, it becomes a little bit easier. Stop that. What you're doing. All right, let's take those That's shields. You guys got your shields? Um, I don't know where they're placed. No, they're all over there. Well, if you want to play along, you could just use the back of a piece of paper. You guys got your markers or a pen? Yeah, I got them. I dropped them. I can hear. Sit down at the table. Right here. Thank you. Here, use your marker. Nicholas, come over here, please. Yeah. Okay, you're all set? Yeah. All right, your shield's divided into four parts. You see that? Yes. First of all, maybe I should say, I, I picked the shield for a reason. You know what the shield is? Who used to use the shield? Nice. Yeah, the knights. Think back in history to the Crusades, and what did the knights use to put on their shields? Uh, the, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Called the coat of arms. The diocese has a coat of arms. The bishop has a coat of arms. If you like genealogy, your family probably has a coat of arms. Okay, and what's on that coat of arms is symbols of what's important to the person. Okay, so that's why I picked the shield. So let's do this. The far left-hand corner. Okay, the far left-hand corner. Write down your two favorite subjects in school. Two favorite subjects in school. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard? Yeah. Do you I like a lot of different subjects? Yeah. Okay. Right across from that, write down at least one thing that you like to do in your in your free time. In the right hand thing you like to do in your free time. In the right hand corner or just in right the... across from it in the right hand corner, yes. Okay. <laughs> All set? Okay. Going back to the left again in that in that space. Write down at least one thing that you think you're good at. One thing that you think you're good at. It could be anything. Wait, are we doing it in the bottom left-hand corner? Bottom, yes, that's okay. right. It, uh, and if you get mixed up, it doesn't really matter. Veronica, anywhere, in school, out of school. Whatever you want to put down. Okay, in the last section, this might be the hardest one. 
write down one gift that you think God has given to you. One gift that you think God has given to you. Uh, okay, Tartaglia kids, I want you to share your shields with your parents. Share your shields with your parents. Uh, you can hold it up. I should do it. All right. It's so it's funny because I put it in the Wow. Did you get a picture? Do I have to? Yeah. Oh. All right. So put in. Yeah, two, your two favorite subjects. Okay, sh uh, share now with your brothers and sisters. <laughs> okay. What does yours say? Oh, yeah, yeah. What does it say? Oh, okay. Or more, more or less like. Was no bike riding. Oh, bike riding. It's hard to write cursive with a marker. Not like spelling. It's English. <laughs> okay. Did you learn anything from doing this? Uh. Last one really made me think because it's not really what I want to do because I'm not good at some things I like doing. Like I'm not good at swimming, but this really made me think. Because in the last square, like, what am I good at doing? <laughs> which is which differs from what I like doing, I guess. A good insight. Because we we might enjoy doing something that we're not good at. I'm right there with you with swimming. I can't swim, but I love to be in the pool. Yeah. Um, what this one's over here. Or, um, Maria, how about you? Um. Let's see. I I don't know if I learned anything new. Um, because I had a, an idea of what I, I wanted to do. Um, in life, so, but it was a really good refresher for me to think about it. Maria, I'm sorry to jump in, but Maria often ask, asks me that she doesn't know how to incorporate music in helping other people, when, especially when she gets older, but there's ways even now because I think you could sing for our neighbors. I know that they would really enjoy that, especially now because we're, they were, I just overheard them this morning saying there's not much going on. Yeah. What, like, what you, what but, um, but yeah, that I didn't know exactly. No, this was in that one. Now, <clears throat> If I were to come back in five years and ask you to do this same thing, do you think you might have the same answer? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I think, I bet, I think I bet so. it would be a little different. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Why do you think they might be different? Because as we grow, our interests change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because we have more experiences. Yeah. 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 So doing an exercise like this as a family, talking about it afterwards, um, can be a nice way to get a good discussion going and also help kids to understand that they have gifts. And one important thing to understand is sometimes it takes another person 
to recognize a gift or a talent that they see in us. And that might blow us away. That somebody might say that we have a certain talent that we have no idea that we have. So that's why it's very important to be affirming, you know, affirming and, and helping others to recognize those and those talents. What are you going to do? Sometimes you have a talent that you don't know about, but somebody sees it. Exactly. And they have to encourage you. you they have to bring it out of you. That's happened to me. Yes. It's a wonderful gift to give to another person. Yeah. So parents, parents then can help their kids as they grow up by providing a variety of experiences, not a, and not every experience, <laughs> running ragged, every sport and every dance lesson and music lessons and all that, but a variety of experiences that the kids have some say in. For example, my mother used to make me take piano lessons and I hated it. But don't torture kids making them do things that, that they're not going to like. I'm not saying don't make them try something that they don't like. Don't torture them by making them stay in it if they don't like it. So by giving them a variety of experiences and then providing time to talk and reflect on what those experiences mean. I love this quote by Pope St. John Paul. He said, people stand up and insist that every child is a unique and unrepeatable gift of God. The, just a beautiful, beautiful saying. And the awesome responsibility that parents and family members have to help kids to realize that. And parents... I don't need to tell you this. Parents are the single most important influence on the faith of their children. Single most important influence. Okay, and it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be giving a complete notion here if we didn't talk just briefly about the states of life. And thinking about vocation, the church gives us a little bit of a structure. It's called the states of life. You guys know what the states of life are? There's four of them. Ever heard of them? No. No? Okay. Take a guess. So, okay. Yeah. You probably could guess them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think so. Think about what are some of the things in the church that we're encouraged to think about becoming? Um, called the <laughs> Priest. holy life. Okay. Yeah, excellent. That's one. The, um, married. Becoming married. Marriage is another. Yep. Yeah. Um, single. Single life is another. And then there's another one. Um, Consecrated life. Okay, so that's like, like religious sisters, religious priests, religious mothers. Okay. So we've got the ordained. So the church tries to help us think about in terms of the ordained ministry, which would be priests, and who else gets ordained in the church? And deacons, yeah, priests and deacons. Then we have consecrated life for men and women. They take three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Then we have marriage, which is by far what most people are called to. And then we have a few people who have, this, who live the single life. So what are the, the church also tells us that some of the characteristics of all four of those states in life, that they're meant to be lifelong, they're meant to be stable, they're meant to be prayed about and considered carefully. 
They're chosen, you're called to this, and chosen according to your gifts, talents, and temperament. And it is the way you will live holiness. So for example, Tartaglia kids, your mom's job is to get your father to heaven. That's a hard job, isn't it? Harder than you might think. And dad's job is to get mom to heaven, seriously. That's how serious the marriage relationship is. Priests and deacons, people in the ordained life, their life is the way that they get to heaven. Their relationship with their bishop and the church is the way they get to heaven. That's the way they live holiness. Likewise with the consecrated life or the single life. Another thing to remember is one is not any better than another. I think sometimes as Catholics we think that it's better to be a priest or it's better to be a sister. That's not how we should look at this. We should look at it as God calls us, according to our gifts and talents, to a certain state in life. And if we choose wisely, we'll be happy. And the final thing, and I love this one the best, sometimes we mess it up. Sometimes we don't choose correctly for whatever reason. Maybe we haven't prayed about it enough. Maybe we just messed up by making a bad decision. Sometimes we mess it up. We have to pick ourselves up and try to fix it, you know, in some way. So I think the church in its wisdom gave us this way of kind of trying to frame the idea of vocation. And then within the vocation of marriage, let's say, there's the vocation to husband, wife, parent. Okay, there's a vocation within a vocation. <clears throat> okay, I think, um, and one last point. Our job is not our vocation, okay? Our job is not our vocation. A job can be anything. It's the way we earn money. But it really isn't our vocation. So we should never confuse those two things. Okay, I think I'm uh, I think I'm about done. Thank you. Um, and, uh, Christina, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine a while ago um, said this, and I passed it along to my children. The and she, I thought it was wonderful. She said that after receiving Jesus in Holy Communion. A wonderful thing to talk about with Jesus is to ask him and, and ask his him to show you the person what he would like them to do in life as as work and but and separately to what state that they're being called to. So this great, was, great point. So I, as a parent, um, I appreciate I appreciated um, reminders um, of what you said, and I I really love that one is not better than another. Um, I really liked that. Yeah, I think sometimes we think one is better than another, but it, it's it's not. If we choose wrongly, we're not going to be happy. If we can't get in touch with what we're called to do, we're not going to be happy. And I, before I forget, I did want to say one thing, especially to the kids. <clears throat> in terms of prayer, um, actually, it was uh, one of the minor girls shared this, and it really, really struck me. I was telling your father about this the other day. She started, it was Erin Minor, she started at a very young age to pray for whoever her future husband was going to be. And I just think that's a really beautiful thing. Uh, you know, if you, and you can pray, even if you don't end up getting married, you can still pray.
pray for who your future husband's going to be. I think God would understand it as maybe whatever your vocation is going to be. But the idea is to pray early on, like your mom said, for whatever that vocation is. And if you really think you're called to marriage, pray for your future husband or your future wife, whoever that might happen to be. And that way, God will make sure you two get together. Well, thanks for being guinea pigs, Tartaglias and Lillian. <laughs> Lillian, do you have any last minute words? No, I'm fine. I understand everything. I'm good. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll be able to share with the kids as you're doing online schooling. Mm. What'd you say? Hopefully you'll be able to share some of this with the kids as you're doing the online schooling. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Come here. Let us see you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.